Tina koto, tina koto, tina koto katoa. Welcome to the Offshore Wind Forum for New Zealand and my, most particularly for Taranaki. Thank you all for joining us and in particular a special thanks to our panellists who are joining us from around the world. So we have people with us today from the United Kingdom, from the south of France, Australia and Tokyo. So a truly international flavour um, to our Offshore Wind Forum which is very appropriate. To the forum for tonight's webinar, we've got um, all our panellists are going to be doing a presentation and then we have the Q&A function available for you in the webinar. So if you have any questions that you would like any of our panellists to answer, please type those into the Q&A and then we will answer them at the end of the forum. So we'll wait till everyone has done their presentations and then we will get to the Q&A um, as and when we have time. If there are, however, some questions that panellists feel able to answer um, immediately through through the through the chat or through through typing an answer, they will do that. But otherwise, we'll hold the questions till the end. So, without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome our first presenter. So, our first presenter is Bruce Valpy. He's the managing director of BVG Associates Limited. So, um, Bruce has a background in renewable energy strategy consultancy and helped founded BVG Associates in two thousand and six. And now he has a global client base that includes startups, market leaders, trade bodies, governments and multinationals all focused on offshore wind. And Bruce has played a key role in helping companies, regions and countries understand and succeed in the wind industry. And Bruce, you might recognise from his accent, um, has actually spent a lot of time um, in New Zealand um, and has family in New Zealand. Bruce is going to cover for us today, um, looking at current and future geographical markets, why offshore wind has been so successful, what's needed to establish a successful offshore wind market, why volume is important, and how we can get it in New Zealand. So welcome, Bruce. Hey, thanks very much. Uh, good day, all. Uh, I've yeah, just got a few slides to, to share. Um, and I point at various documents along the way in my in my presentation that uh, that are free to download and just maybe useful background uh, background reading or, or or learning for those that are that bit newer to to offshore wind. One of those is uh, www.guidetoanoffshorewindfarm.com that's uh, got a whole pile of sort of technical and cost information that that, that just may be relevant to people. So uh, I lead BVG Associates, a strategy consultancy uh, focused on the on the wind industry. We work in the uh, in the business, uh, economics, and, uh, and and technology space, and uh, yeah, website that with loads of loads of relevant information for the industry. Uh, and uh, as as introduced, uh, I'm going to address four four key questions that you've got there. Um, the uh, the photos here, just a little bit of background on me. Um, the, uh, the big one in the middle is uh, is me up a wind turbine, um, changing a pitch system on a on a old sort of two megawatt scale turbine. So I'm a, a design engineer. Spent the first 15 years of my career designing wind turbines, and then the second 15 years uh, consulting uh, on the on, on the market. Uh, the picture on the right is of uh, some old two-bladed turbines that I designed many years ago uh, and I don't know uh, if any of you know the company Windflow and Jeff Henderson, a real pioneer of the wind industry in, in New Zealand uh, and his turbines uh, look very like our old turbines because actually he used to work in the same company and then with our blessing he, he headed off uh, uh, back home to, uh, to, to make his way uh, in, in the onshore wind industry in New Zealand. And the picture on the left uh, is a little chapel um, in Glenorchy uh, that, uh, yeah, that my family built uh, back in 1889. Um, for better or worse, uh, the Valpi family was, was one of the first um, uh, settlers to head down to, to, to Otago. So we've been around for, a, uh, around for a while in New Zealand. So uh, start with, uh, uh, with, with, with question one. Uh, around the uh, the the global uh, the global market, so uh, on the left here you've just got a, a picture of of our view of how the uh, the the global offshore wind market uh, will grow over the next uh, ten years, and then on the right uh, looking looking further ahead. Green is is uh, is uh, is Europe. Um, the, uh, the the darker blues are uh, APAC region, and then the lighter blues are uh, uh, are the Americas. 
And historically, the industry has grown up in, in, in Asia, uh, but now led by China, uh, there's a lot of activity happening uh, in, the, in, in the APAC region. The US uh, hasn't really got going yet, but there's, uh, there's, a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of talk about projects. We're, we're quite involved. In, uh, in, in getting things going from a state's perspective uh, and uh, towards the middle of the decade, we're, we, we think we'll really start getting more projects happening. Uh, but we can unpack uh, individual uh, markets at, at some point if it's useful for you. So looking beyond the, the next decade, um, uh, Europe gradually re relinquishes its, its market lead to, uh, to, to, um, to, to APAC. And we're seeing sort of growth rates of seven, eight um, percent over the next uh, um, three decades, leading up to something like 2050. Uh, Europe will 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 grow, but you see it sort of stabilising there in green, and then uh, and then maybe declining slightly as we head towards 2050, because uh, although it's got a globally relevant offshore wind resource, actually it's it's pretty full. Um, a uh, lot of different uh, uses for the uh, for the seas, uh, and uh, and it and it may well start stabilising out, uh, uh, so heading for for something like 400, 500 gigawatts of uh, of offshore wind by 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 2050. I highlight two uh, two reports there, uh, top right. Uh, the first. Um, uh, uh, our energy, our future. We published for the Trade Body Wind Europe that looked at the 450 gigawatt sort of vision for offshore wind up to 2050. And the one on the uh, on the on the right, uh, sorry, was published um, last week by a coalition of key industry players. Uh, the Power of Our Ocean is the first to sort of put a, a, a global um, vision for offshore wind up to 2050 on on the table at uh, 1.4 terawatts of 1,400 gigawatts of, of offshore wind. Uh, you can see we're, we're only at the uh, um, sub 50 gigawatts at the moment. So there's a, there's, there's a long way to go in that, uh, in, in that, in that journey. Offshore wind is a, is a young industry. It's something like 18 years behind the onshore wind industry at the moment in terms of the amount of capacity uh, installed. Uh, and if it keeps if it keeps going at 18 uh, um, years behind, then 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 it'll be on target for this sort of this this sort of growth. So um, why is offshore wind been so so successful um, in following onshore wind success over over recent years? Uh, the uh, um, the picture on the right is uh, is taken again from the same uh, publication that uh, um, that we authored, and sets out some of the uh, some of the key uh, the key benefits. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's it's, it's 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 a good read. There's a lot of stuff in that document and, and well worth a look. But some of the headlines over on the on the left hand side. Uh, the key thing is that offshore wind uh, is now just cheaper than most forms of uh, fossil um, generation, especially uh, new build gas in, in, in most markets. Obviously, uh, offshore wind is cheapest where it's, where it's windiest, uh, which is where New Zealand uh, especially comes along. So uh, over the recent years, the, uh, the cost of energy, the levelized cost of energy um, has, has reduced by over, over three quarters. There's been a huge focus in the industry on, on, on cost reduction, and that's paid, uh, paid great dividends. But also, um, our offshore wind offers uh, renewable energy uh, at, at a real scale. Uh, typically, projects 10 times bigger than, than onshore, and fewer constraints as to where to build. Um, I'm used to projects in Northern Europe where it's, it's, it's getting pretty crowded for, for, for onshore wind. Uh, and offshore wind, you can just... Uh, you've, you've got to be obviously uh, careful about the environmental and social uh, implications of where you're building, but uh, typically there is uh, there's more space to do big projects. Also, the benefits of offshore wind really work for governments. Uh, significant uh, uh, volumes of carbon uh, reduction and uh, often uh, done right, uh, significant numbers of jobs created in the right locations. Uh, lastly, uh, the industry is is attractive for uh, for finances. 
Uh, this is industry that's being delivered uh, at scale, but on time uh, and on budget. It's got a real positive history uh, of that over the over the years, where where many other in infrastructure builds are are, are are delayed. I think that's really because you're doing a serious serious production job. Uh, building uh, 100 turbines uh, or, or, or more in the same location uh, with some real repeat processes that, that just aren't there in oil and gas and, 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 and many other infrastructure areas. Uh, the, other, the other interest to pension funds and others is that there's some real confidence in the long-term revenue that you'll earn. Uh, from uh, offshore wind farms. You don't have a fuel price uh, that you're just not sure about uh, looking into the future. So lots of benefits uh, that has uh, really led to uh, things going really well. So uh, what's, what's needed for a country to, uh, to uh, establish a successful uh, offshore wind market? We've uh, experienced that in the UK, but we've also had a look uh, at other markets as they've established. Um, and especially for some recent work we've been doing, uh, and again, a couple of reports on, on the right-hand side, uh, in Japan uh, and uh, in writing a, a big roadmap for uh, offshore wind in Vietnam. It's a, it's a common question for people to say, well, what is it that's really worked? Why has the industry been successful? And, and yes, here's just a few of our, our sort of headlines. Uh, I think key is, is, is something around some real good government and industry confidence uh, and, and collaboration. It's been really important. And uh, a first ingredient has been uh, the development of, of really large scale, uh, large scale stable markets. There's been a clear long term logic for why offshore wind makes sense in a country. The, the supply chains that need to establish uh, aren't going to pay back on the first project. The companies are needing to invest for the long term and they've got to have a sense that the company, the, the country is investing for the long term too. So there needs to be real logic for why offshore wind makes sense in that country uh, in terms of the wind resource, in terms of the electricity generation mix uh, and, and, and the like. Also, uh, in, in, in relatively quick time, there need to be some good streamlined and stable uh, transparent regulations. This is around the leasing processes, the permitting, the, the, the power purchase agreements. And the more now that the industry is progressing elsewhere in the world, world, the more that those, those uh, regulations are consistent with the global market, the easier it is for global players to come and play. And a lot of the time, if you want the cost reductions uh, that have happened, but will, that will continue, you need to draw in those global, those global players. There's a room for uh, local suppliers, uh, but a lot of the time it's going to be the global wind farm developers that are going to play a key role. Uh, and if, if you've developed a, and set up an offshore wind market in a similar way to elsewhere in the world, then that really helps that, uh, that, that progression. Also, um, it's really uh, valuable to set up uh, industrial policies to, to foster an internationally competitive domestic industry. We've seen some countries take more of a protectionist approach that adds cost, uh, maybe slows the market and, and in the end decreases the number of jobs to be created. So there's some real care needed in, in, in that sort of space. Also, you want a power purchase regime uh, that de-risks uh, the uh, developer's exposure to, to long-term uh, energy price fluctuation. A wind farm being developed now may well go into operation uh, in the later part of the decade and will be around and generating uh, up to 2050. And in that timescale, uh, there'll be some significant changes in the, in the future energy uh, systems in, in countries often led by, by governments. Uh, wind power producers can take the risk on, on the weather, whether it's going to be windy or not, but uh, they need a little help when, when, when no one quite knows what the energy systems are going to look like a long term ahead. Uh, last, uh, as I mentioned it, uh, really valuable to have uh, government industry dialogue uh, and, and alignment. Uh, this is a joint effort uh, and uh, we've seen that, that sharing understanding often dissolves barriers that, that can be uh, seem unsurmountable, but the industry's got a great can-do attitude, solved lots of problems and uh, dialogue really helps there. So the little plot I show on the right-hand side there is of this sort of 
big cost reduction over over recent years. A little slow um, uh, looking forward, um, but it, but actually we will carry on seeing cost reduction, larger turbines, uh, more volume, uh, more innovation will carry on driving costs down. And you see floating offshore wind coming in there that Bruno will talk a little bit more about. Uh, but in lots of markets, that'll be absolutely overlapping on the cost sort of bands um, by uh, the end of this decade and, and the start of the next. So um, why volume is important uh, in New Zealand uh, and, and how does it get it? Uh, a couple of slides. Uh, so uh, proper map of the world you see here. I remember visiting uh, the wizard um, outside um, Christchurch Cathedral many years ago and uh, bought my little map like this uh, the right way up uh, and uh, you see that that, that offshore that, that the New Zealand has a globally relevant uh, offshore wind resource the red is the windy places uh, and a lot of the stuff at the bottom of this map is is uh, is ice bound a lot of the year so it's really not available uh, so uh, Europe uh, and, and, the, and the shallow seas uh, have seen as a great uh, home for offshore wind at the start. Um, uh, uh, but actually, as I say, the, the, uh, the industry will spread out elsewhere. And you see a minute little speck in China uh, of, of, of sort of exciting wind resource. A lot of stuff at sort of uh, nine meters a second, which is fine. You can, you can, you can, you can be successful there. But New Zealand has something pretty special, uh, as does uh, as does South America. So, but I think really to, to tap into that, New Zealand has a pretty local, uh, a low local uh, electricity demand. So, so to tap into that resource and 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 make best use of something that is of global relevance needs quite a big strategy, in some way. So uh, we see that global, global volume will continue to drive investment, uh, innovation and, and, and cost of energy reduction in, in, in offshore wind. That'll, that'll happen. But it's the, it's the local volume that drives the, uh, the, the local economic benefits. Um, the, you've really got to have quite a big volume to build new factories. Uh, unless you're putting in some protectionist policies that get factories built, but hey, they often don't really deliver. Um, uh, and, and can often be expensive. So uh, you need a, a regional market of five gigawatts or more a year to really establish a competitive supply chain and, and, and get the benefits uh, for, for the local offshore wind of, of cost reduction and, and, and competition and, and, and the rest of it. And, and New Zealand will, will maybe, uh, its own electricity demand maybe, maybe will, will drive five gigawatts of offshore wind in, in total over the years. Uh, so we see that it can choose between some sort of small niche industry, a uh, handful of good sized projects, um, the orange picture on the left below, or, or doing something around hydrogen uh, and floating wind to, uh, to really tap into that global, globally relevant resource. So what does the picture on the left look like? A niche industry, mainly uh, make, could be fixed, um, bottom fixed um, foundations onto the seabed um, or, or floating offshore wind that will take over uh, probably in the, in the, uh, in, in the 2030s. Uh, you'll have to have construction port or ports uh, in New Zealand. That's, that's vital to have locally. So you'll pick up business there. Operation will be done locally and lots of through life services. Um, but most of the hardware will, will be imported at, at, at that sort of scale industry. The specialist vessels will come in, do the job and, and leave. There'll be some technical input uh, and consultancies uh, and, and teams doing local work on environmental issues and the like. Um, but it'll, it'll be a higher cost of energy than the picture on the, on, on the right. And maybe if you do well, you'll capture 25% local content, something like that. But that's, that's doing pretty well, I think, if you, if you got to that level. Or else you can be on the right, a, a bigger industry uh, that'll be mainly floating offshore wind, but uh, very much linked to hydrogen production. You can use this this globally relevant resource. Uh, you can probably pick up uh, more of the uh, the heavy steel manufacture um, if you if you work hard there. You could get up to something like fifty percent local content, um, maybe at a push. 
uh, you'll probably need some sort of very high wind turbine variant to tap into the wind resources most effectively there and show that there's so so your friends in South America working together there will need to be enough market here to get the big turbine suppliers designing something that really works um, and then you'll be you'll be exporting hydrogen globally uh, and uh, and a side effect of this is there's a real chance to to, to set up a, an economy uh, that is competitive through low cost energy uh, production and, and and low cost green hydrogen uh, production, uh, which can be a real differentiator looking forward. I think there's all sorts of uh, new things on that journey on the right that that aren't in place at the moment. Um, Getting hydrogen delivered from electricity at the right price isn't there yet, but hey, there's a lot of work going on in that sort of space. So uh, we'd love to explore that journey uh, more as time goes on with you and think now's the time to really start exploring that. So that's my introduction. Um, uh, we are very much active globally. Um, there's a list of sort of things that we're doing there on the, on, on, in, in the box uh, from global studies, European studies, work in Vietnam, Japan, um, Taiwan, uh, Korea, the US, back in our home markets in the in, in the UK, we're working for most of the big uh, wind farm developers and, and turbine suppliers and helped a lot of players enter the market uh, from, uh, from an oil and gas background and another background. So hopefully have some useful things to, to offer to this debate. I think that's my, uh, my, my, my 20 minutes done. So uh, uh, back to you, Justine. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Bruce. That was a really great overview. Um, and I think, you know, you've highlighted the potential for New Zealand, um, as well as what are some of the key elements that need to be in place. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'll introduce our next speaker now. Um, so this is Bruno. Bruno is the Chief Sales and Marketing Officer of Ideol and Chairman of the off Floating Offshore Wind Committee. He's also part of Wind Europe's Floating Offshore Wind Work Group, which he's chaired for three years. Um, and so Bruno is going to specifically talk to us in particular about the types of technology um, that are coming to the fore and in particular floating technology. Um, and so beyond working on IDOL's recognised and patented floating wind technology, Bruno also spends a lot of his time um, explaining to people um, about offshore wind um, to policymakers, financial institutions, asset developers, etc. Um, across the globe. Um, and he is also a regular speaker and chairperson at offshore wind events um, in US, Asia and Europe. And Kochi is the world's largest event that's solely dedicated to floating offshore wind. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Bruno, beaming in from the south of France. Yes, uh, thank you, Justine. Thank you to all the organizers and to the fellow panelists. <clears throat> Do you see my screen that I have shared? Perfect. Thank you. Um, yes, hello from the south of France. Now, one little thing. I'm originally from Belgium. I played rugby and I'm certainly not a supporter of the French team. I'm, I've always been dressed in black during game days, on game days. So, um, yes, floating wind. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip the kind introduction as far as uh, who I am and what I do. Um, and basically go over what we're going to do today. I'll go a little bit over why floating wind and what is floating wind, some of the key technologies that are emerging, the key geographies, where we are seeing floating wind, the current industry status, current challenges, and uh, why we could consider and should consider floating wind in New Zealand. So uh, why floating wind? Well, first and foremost, I mean, floating wind is not a revolution is just a logical evolution like we saw a little bit with oil and gas. Uh, you first saw, saw onshore exploration and, and, and production and then near shore and then deeper offshore. Well, floating wind is about the same. It's about going to uh, harness the best wind resources where they are without any depth constraint. And with that come a few advantages that are quite uh, cherished in some parts of the world. So further offshore means lesser visual impact. It also means most often less, lesser impact on the other users of the maritime space, which is a non-negligible uh, um, um, aspect, especially when you're trying to gather a consensus amongst all the, uh, the people using the maritime space 
shipping companies, uh, the Navy, uh, radar operators, uh, <clears throat> airstrips, uh, fishermen, of course, oil and gas operators, etc. Um, it's an alternative to fixed bottom in shallow waters. You have, for example, in Taiwan, you have rather shallow waters, but rather challenging seabed, um, which make a floating wind either uh, bottom fixed wind, sorry, not very economically viable, or can lead to environmental issues, whereas um, it's true that piling in um, uh, fixed bottom uh, structures in rather environmentally sensitive areas are not always very welcome. Uh, and there are some floating technologies, very few, but there are, that can um, allow for the installation of floating wind in waters as shallow as 30 meters. Um, it will also also to use cheaper vessels, often vessels that are locally available throughout the uh, offshore installation uh, and commissioning process. Um, there's also, of course, a lot more onshore constructions and operations uh, possible. It's particularly suitable for tomorrow's uh, very large wind turbines. Uh, now all the projects we are working on aiming at um, uh, construction uh, by the mid-20s are all uh, focused on uh, wind turbines in the 14 to 16 megawatt. We can even expect a little larger perhaps. Uh, and it will always be easier to install uh, those extra large wind turbines on top of um, their towers near a harbor than further offshore. Um, and then floating wind is also the only option for certain geographies. I mean, when you look at um, the Western US, uh, basically California, when you look at the French Mediterranean, when you look at a big part of Japan and other parts of the world, um, the water, uh, water depth falls very quickly, very deep. And uh, we cannot deprive those people, of course, from the benefits of offshore wind. So um, we can actually leapfrog straight from uh, no wind or onshore wind to floating without necessarily having to go through the learning curve of fixed bottom. So again, I want to, to really insist on that. There's no need to have a return on experience on fixed bottom before going to floating wind. You have several countries that have gone straight to floating without any um, uh, fixed bottom experience. And there is, of course, a tremendous potential worldwide. Uh, globally, uh, between 60 to 80 percent of the best wind resources near centers of consumption, and that's pretty much across the globe, are uh, beyond in, in water depths of 60 meters and more. Um, so the key technologies, basically today you have four generic uh, architectures. Um, you have uh, the barge, you have semi-submersible, spar buoy, and tension lake platforms. Uh, Semi-submersibles, spar, spar buoys, and tension-like platforms uh, basically come from the oil and gas industry. The barge is an optimized um, uh, design that came straight from a blank sheet of paper, which our company um, developed. Um, so out of those key technologies here, you see them without that uh, ocean background, and you can right away see that they're all extremely different in terms of size, in terms of uh, footprint and especially in terms of bill of material so there will be some architectures that will i will will say have a better chance to accompany the increase in wind turbines and um, their prices will be less affected by um, uh, the um, the fact that they need a bigger a bigger structure to uh, accommodate those larger turbines so in terms of key technologies what you also need to know there have only be three demonstrated technologies today, full-scale demonstrators for three of the architectures. Tension-like platforms are still, still need to be the subject of a full-scale demonstrator anywhere in the world. Uh, it translates into today, basically, you have the three demonstrated technologies that are bankable, if I might say, or insurable, the tension-like platforms, and its little brothers, sisters, and cousins still require that return on experience, that full-scale um, <clears throat> uh, sea keeping analysis, etc., before being deemed uh, bankable. Now, in terms of key geographies, um, basically you have 
four uh, countries that were uh, the initial um, pioneers. Um, it started in Norway initially. Uh, Japan uh, invested quite a lot in the full-scale demonstrators. Portugal had one and France had one. Beyond that, you do have a couple of other markets that have followed uh, Sud Scotland uh, and Spain. And then you have other, other markets where floating wind is definitely a subject of more, more than the subject of conversation, where there are actually uh, plans for full scale um, uh, and commercial scale um, arrays. Um, and those are the US, uh, Italy, uh, China, of course, Taiwan, and South Korea. Uh, but basically, as you can see, it spans the entire planet. And I would love to see the New Zealand on that map um, showing up very soon. Um, current industry status, as I indicated, three bankable technologies. Uh, the fact that the wind turbines are getting bigger and bigger, that will have a major impact on which technologies will actually survive. And that is for different reasons. The bigger the wind turbines, the bigger impact on the size of the substructures. The, the, the constructability, um, the, um, the launchability of those structures. Some, some floaters, when you put a, a 16 megawatt wind turbine on top of, of them, will only be about 50 meters by 50 meters. Others will be double the size, and that will create some major issues when you have to find a port or a yard to build it, to store it, to install it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and um, what's very exciting now is after several years of uh, demonstrator projects and, and pre-commercial projects, you now see commercial scale tenders, which is uh, a demonstration that the market, uh, that uh, policymakers, and ultimately the, the, the financial financing industry believe that uh, the market and the some of the technologies are mature enough to justify commercial scale tenders. So you have next year, Three, uh, two, com uh, one commercial scale standard of 250 megawatt that comes out in France. It will be followed by two more in uh, 2022. Uh, Scotland is currently um, starting a round of uh, auctions and lease standards where most of the sites that have been pre identified by the Scottish government are exclusively dedicated to floating. Uh, Japan is starting. So basically, it's, it's not about Floating is no longer an R&D issue. It's all about um, uh, commercial readiness and it is commercially ready. Uh, of course, um, since uh, floating wind doesn't benefit yet from the uh, economy of scale um, that one can observe with a fixed bottom, uh, there will be uh, a need for a, a scale up, but um, the, the cost reduction that we've observed with fixed bottom will actually accelerate and uh, happen much faster with floating wind. And then there's something that is less tangible, but that is as important, is the carbon footprint and local content. Increasingly, as uh, countries are um, launching tenders, um, you see that beyond cost, there are a couple of other issues that are extremely important. Uh, local content, of course, and I'll get to that a little later when we'll be talking about New Zealand, and um, the carbon footprint, because there's no point in promoting renewables if that means uh, manufacturing steel structures in China and then um, dragging them all across the globe um, on, on diesel powered uh, vessels, um, you know, what, what's the point? Uh, so we have to be increasingly um, careful about that. And that's also why uh, uh, a large number of countries now are looking at um, scoring their projects. Uh, when they're examining um, uh, tender proposals and, and scoring them with, with a car carbon footprint uh, score if needed. Local content is the same. Now, uh, who, who, who is, I talked about the market now, a little bit about who we are. Well, um, we are basically a company that has been, um, that's, has been involved in floating wind for the last 10 years. Uh, as we've been created 10 years ago, uh, we are a patented floating technology provider. We also work as EPCI work package provider. And first and foremost, we are also a project co-developer and equity partner. Uh, basically, we put our money where our mouth is. We believe in our technology. 
And that is why we are developing projects in Scotland. We have four commercial skill projects and partnerships ongoing in Japan and in other parts of the world. So um, we have also funding available to develop projects in New Zealand. Um, based on the initial research I have made, there is a real business case to be um, uh, had there. Now, uh, beyond that, well, we are the only technology in the world that has two full-scale demonstrators um, on two different continents, Europe and Asia. And what is also very interesting is the following. Well, we have one here, a floater in France, one in Japan, and the local content, and that is uh, to go back to, um, to what I mentioned about the interest for New Zealand, is in France, local content of this floater, 91.6% of all the value of all the orders that were placed for the construction of this floater were done locally. In Japan, we managed 90 point, 92.9%. Uh, uh, there's no reason why we would not be able to do the same in New Zealand. Um, so relevant for New Zealand, well, local content, very simply. I, I heard, of course, about, uh, that five gigawatts were mentioned, but um, and to justify the setup of, a, of, of, of an industry, et cetera. Well, I, I, I agree that uh, five gigawatts would be an extremely exciting figure. But however, uh, I also believe that you don't need five gigawatts to develop local content. Uh, you can also do it very simply with a single commercial scale wind farm. And why? Well, basically, um, it's about compact dimensions. As I mentioned, some floaters are basically double the size and double the draft than others. And that is very important because I don't see New Zealand suddenly uh, justifying the construction of a specific harbor infrastructure to build one or two floating wind farms. So the key is to be able to make the most out of existing infrastructure um, and see how you can um, <clears throat> build a commercial wind farm without having to uh, invest two or $300 million in upgrading existing infrastructure to, may, to accommodate um, extremely large substructures. And there's something else, well, concrete hull material. We are the pioneers uh, for using concrete as hull material. Um, everywhere in the world where we've been, where we're working on projects, is it the US, is it Europe? Is it Japan? Is it Taiwan? Is it South Korea? Everywhere we've demonstrated that concrete is actually cheaper than steel. So basically, I sincerely believe that even New Zealand can have its cake and eat it too, have cheap floating offshore wind and build locally. No need to go to Singapore, and, and which has wonderful industrial capabilities, but why go to Singapore when you can have the same thing built in New Zealand at the same price? Um, so, and why, why can you, can I claim that? It's very simple because we build out of concrete using locally implementable construction methods that have been time tested. And there's plenty, there are plenty of uh, uh, major civil engineering and construction firms in New Zealand that have the capabilities to do this. No need to import know-how. You do have uh, several major construction companies that have the know-how to build this in New Zealand. Second thing, well, if you don't have the major um, uh, infrastructure or harbor infrastructure that you can find in South Korea, in Singapore, et cetera, well, you can look at different construction sites and our structure allows for flexibility. Is it um, <coughs> building it on floating barges, in a dry dock, on the <coughs> in a graving dock, on semi-submersible barges, in a harbor yard, there are ways to adapt concrete construction so you can build it locally using ex existing infrastructure. Same with launching methods. You don't necessarily need the whole big dry docks. There are plenty of ways to launch uh, concrete structures in the water um, without again having to resort to the construction of new infrastructure. And basically, uh, of course, uh, New Zealand is not particularly known, well, it's better known for rugby than for uh, offshore wind at, at this point. And, and there will be uh, the need to import some foreign expertise, but just a little. Uh, because 
uh, you already have the port infrastructures and construction know-how to build it and launch it uh, today. It's not even tomorrow. You do have it now. We've assessed and we've audited all the harbors uh, that one can find in New Zealand, and there are several, not only one, but there are a couple, or uh, there are more than a couple actually, where you can actually even share the work, build structures in one place, install the wind turbine somewhere else, actually providing jobs not only to one harbor, but to several local communities. Uh, the other thing is, well, you do have also an existing offshore oil and gas expertise. You do have equipment, you do have vessels, you do have a supply chain that can be reutilized. There's no need to reinvent the wheel, to bring in new companies, new suppliers. You already have quite a lot of know-how available to be able to implement it much sooner than you think. And of course, um, you can also, you also have great universities, technical institutes, etc., where you can train people, as, as uh, Bruce mentioned, um, developing an offshore wind project takes time, sufficient time to actually train, locally train technicians to climb up those wind, wind um, towers and, and, uh, and uh, turbines and, 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 and manage the uh, operations and maintenance of them, etc. So basically, this is it. You guys are ready. Uh, you didn't know it, but well, actually, you know it today. And uh, I'll be glad to support any kind of initiative and uh, any kind of company that would be interested to discuss this further. Uh, but the, the future looks bright in New Zealand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. What a um, lovely night to end on in terms of the, the, the future looks bright. And you've also um, led us to a perfect segue to our next speaker. Um, so um, thank you very much for that, Bruno. It's a very, very inspiring presentation. So now I'd like to um, introduce Gillian Cagney. So Gillian is the president for Warley of Australia and New Zealand, and also including um, Papua New Guinea and Mongolia. Um, you can ask her later perhaps about why, why those other two territories are associated with Australia and New Zealand. She gets that one all the time. Um, yeah, so well, welcoming Gillian. Um, Gillian's going to talk to us about um, the supply chain um, in terms of this exciting new opportunity around offshore wind. And so I think a perfect segue from, Bru well, from what Bruno was just talking about in terms of the existing skill sets um, in New Zealand and specifically, obviously, from our perspective in Taranaki. Just also noting, so Gillian's background is that she um, is an engineer, has been in the energy sector for a long time, has worked all over the world, um, but particularly including Australia and New Zealand. Um, but you'll notice from her accent that she is from Ireland. So Gillian. Thank you, Justine. Um, and thanks for the, the invite um, this afternoon. Uh, so tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Um, so this evening I'm going to be talking about the, um, uh, the supply chain um, and the opportunities that it will bring to, uh, to Taranaki. So just a bit of uh, context on who my screen works. There we go. Who Worley are. Um, so Worley is a project delivery company with over 52,000 people worldwide, helping to advise, develop, build, operate and maintain complex facilities across the energy sector. Um, and we have a team of 400 people in New Zealand um, and have a, a, a team in Taranaki uh, for over the last 25 years. So it's, it's great to be able to partake in uh, this afternoon and this evening's um, presentation. So just a bit of context. So the potential of offshore wind is well documented. And this quote from BNEF outlines the potential. Offshore wind is benefiting from a 67% reduction in levelized costs achieved since 2012 and the performance of the latest giant turbines. So it really shows the opportunity and, and how far um, offshore wind has come in terms of development. So offshore wind has gained significant traction in Europe and parts of Asia are expected to continue its growth trajectory. The cost of offshore wind um, has decreased significantly as of 2019. It was 78 US dollars per megawatt hour, which is down 32% from 2018. The levelized cost of electricity, which is LCOE, is on track to drop 41% by 2030. And the graph on the left illustrates the trend up to 2050. 
Offshore wind is a low environmental impact technology. Its carbon footprint is offset within eight, six months or less, and it cuts significant amount of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides, and it also saves water, as Bruce mentioned in the beginning. The graph on the right shows the predicted installed capacity globally. By 2030 alone, this represents 160 gigawatts and a $545 billion USD investment. However, regional and even country-specific growth rates may vary. In Asia, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan are leading, followed by Vietnam. Vietnam is important as it highlights the journey Asia is on to develop its supply chain and achieve the forecasted growth. The offshore wind system presents significant cost advantages, but they will look different from today. To achieve lower LCOE, the generator turbines will become larger, which triggers a series of system design changes. So to give you an idea, turbines will get to approximately 15 megawatts for an average of nine megawatts today, and projects in Europe are already committing to 13 megawatt turbines. They will have installed further, they will be installed further away from the coast, which high voltage DC cables longer than 100 kilometers, and floating will become more widespread. Monopiles currently dominate the industry, but these types of structures are now pushing boundaries, and it will not be surprising to see monopiles reaching 11 meters in diameter, two and a half thousand tons, and in depth of up to 40 to 50 meters. And this is a massive challenge for the manufacturing and in installation industry. For deep water, jackets will become more common, and it's worth noting in offshore wind that 55 meters is about the deepest installation to date. This is not compared to the oil and gas standards, but the volume required of a, on an on offshore wind farm and the impact it has on LCOE. Designs will be standardized, automation is essential, and raising and maturing a supply chain in Asia will be important. Life extension through continuous investment of the assets will be key, and there will be a greater importance on O&M. The rising offshore wind will also impact the overall power infrastructure, providing green, low-cost electricity impacts various industries. As Bruno mentioned, floating is still very much an emerging and evolving technology solution. And but with more wind farms exploring this option, the technology is growing with interest and investment. Every geographic region has its own needs, and in Europe, 80% of Europe's offshore wind is in the waters deeper than 60 meters. At these depths, fix gets expensive and floating becomes comparable based on reduced installation costs. Another key concern for fixed foundations is the limited availability of installation vessels capable of operating in deep water that have sufficient lift weight and high capacity to, form to perform installation and major components change out. There are a number of benefits to floating offshore wind in the table below. I won't go through the detail as, as Bruno has covered most of this in the, his presentation, but there's increased wind exploitation, Shore side assembly will eliminate heavy lifts and reduce the risk with less weather dependency. There is a larger resource base as it's not restricted to shallower water depths. Um, as you'll see, um, it has the ability to conduct major repairs and upgrades by towing the structures to shore. And deployment can be, can be further offshore, creating less planning risk and visual impacts. Another item is anchored moorings through pre-installation gravity anchors and mooring lines can eliminate piling activities and associated neg negative uh, environmental impacts, as well as um, an improve in safety risk associated with less activities offshore. So the world would be too boring without any challenges, which we as technology and engineering professionals love to solve but not all challenges are technical or technological in nature. Challenges vary alongside the industry's regional maturity level. New Zealand is a new entrant and will require support from the Asian supply chain, which in itself is emerging. However, we've learned many lessons from Europe that can be incorporated into this journey. The pace of WTG development has put massive pressure on the supply chain to keep up. 
with turbines now reaching 15 megawatts and wind farms moving further offshore into deeper waters. Its associated infrastructure is constantly being challenged. Foundation designs are working outside of code. Specialist transportation and installation vessels are being purchased and fabrication yards are being modified to cater for larger structures. Despite this, the focus is still to reduce LCOE. This is being achieved through collaboration across the sector, which has really helped push the market forward, along with standardizing designs, components, and fabrication aspects. Failures in the industry have also helped push the market forward. Learning from grout slippage issues, well defects, and introducing condition monitoring into the structures help to detect early fatigue issues and provide real-time evidence for life extension. From a commercial perspective, the offshore wind sector in Europe has benefited from en government energy policy support and providing su subsidy regimes to allow the technology to be viable in the early days. This process has worked as the sector is now rapidly approaching a subsidy free status. Commercial and contracting models have varied with multi-contract, lot-based contract and EPCI contracts all being tested and tried. Many of the tier one utilities have a much better understanding of risk and local requirements and as such are moving towards multi-contract and managing the risk in-house. Others are still leaning towards EPC, EPCI models where the risk is structured more towards the supply chain. Given increased complexity in the system and, into, and the nascent industry maturity, there are increased risks and front-loading collaboration at concept stage is therefore essential. To achieve lower LCE and accelerate the industry development, more collaboration needs to happen at the concept stage and here's why. At concept stage, the cost uncertainty is very high as the understanding of what I want is very much undefined. With more industry collaboration across the supply chain, the ability to stay close along the cost uncertainty and cost of change curve is better. It reduces the risk of having unexpected change in the system, which would have a significant cost impact. And the importance of making decisions earlier on in the process is key to lowering the cost of CapEx, OpEx, and ultimately LCOE. However, recognition needs to be given to development budgets to ensure that the right amount of studies are executed to avoid unnecessary repeat work down the track. So to address the biggest cost driver, or the biggest driver cost, an optimization effort is ongoing to align the most optimal design with the ability to manufacture, install, operate, and maintain the system. Cost saving potential for larger blades is significant. Blades and turbines will get larger in general, such as for Taranaki, which could potentially be seven to eight megawatt turbines. Larger blades have wide ranging consequences for other system components. Wind farms in planning for 2025 are expected to have 12 to, mega, 12 to 15 megawatt large turbines. And the pace and scale of turbine technology development has, all, has been unprecedented with offshore turbines growing from two megawatts to the recently announced 12 to 15. This growth in technology innovation is one of the key contributing factors to the industry cost reduction drive. The main advantage being that less turbines would need to be installed, fewer foundations, less cable, and fewer sites to travel to for installation and maintenance. For Tadanaki, seven to eight megawatt turbine would have blades of approximately 80 meters long, suspended at 100 meters above seawater level, sat on a fixed foundation approximately 60 meters in height. Foundations are, are likely to be in excess of a thousand tons and at this weight availability of specialized lifting and installation vessels need to be considered. For structures, today monopiles have the monopoly of installed foundation types. Monopiles have traditionally been used in shallower waters near to shore. However, this is currently being challenged and monopiles are now being installed in water depths greater than 40 meters. As the turbines get bigger and the wind farm moves to deeper waters, jackets are becoming more widely used and the supply chain from the hydrocarbon sector has shown, uh, has managed this transition well. For electrical, the transmission is the critical component and is influenced by a number of key elements, 
when identifying an optimum network. Oops, sorry. An optimum network from an onshore wind farm. For O&M, the operation and maintenance costs of offshore wind farms contribute significantly to the overall life costs. The key aspect is that during the 25 year period, the wind farm delivers the returns required whilst also seeking to exceed power targets. Operations and maintenance ensures the wind farm keeps operational and keeps those power targets met or exceeded. Having a supply base and control hub to organize routine inspections is vital. And it's during this phase that OEMs will fulfill their obligations to manage the turbines while mon whilst monitoring performance by the operations teams will be critical. All these elements tie back to the supply chain, which is on a steep learning curve and greater alignment and coordination will add on, on cost saving potential. So the role of the system integrator is essential in managing the overall process across the project life cycle, but also to reduce risk, capex and opex in the development phase itself. We need to apply the best and most advanced industry practices from an environmental, financial and technical perspective. And the balancing act will be to find the most optimal solutions whilst weighing cost and commercial benefits against constructability, logistics and the management of risk itself will all be highly valued skills in the market. Thanks, Justine. Thanks, Gillian. That was a um, fascinating insight into the complexity that, that needs to be managed when you're looking at these projects. So, yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, and great to have Wally's perspective as a worldwide operator um, looking at that. Um, and also, again, a nice segue. So thank you, Gillian. Um, a nice segue to Erin. Um, so Erin is the Chief Development Officer for Australia's first offshore wind project, Star of the South, which many of our webinar participants have probably heard of. Um, this is proposed to be off, located off the south coast of Gippsland um, and going to basically seek to harness a new resource to power up to 1.8 million Victorian homes and creating thousands of jobs during construction and operation. So Erin's going to talk about um, some supply chains, so building off what Gillian's just talked about. What do you, what's needed to actually build, to bring a project like this to life? Um, so yeah, an overview of the current project, um, its investigations and the, the various studies and the stages that it's at. So welcome Erin. Great, thank you so much and uh, good afternoon, good evening everyone, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we're all gathering today uh, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I especially pay my respects to any traditional owners with us on the call, as well as the Gunai Kurnai people uh, who are in the area, the custodians of the land in which Star of the South would be located. Um, I also have um, on the call here Thomas uh, Wagpulsen from Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, who are our funders, and uh, we'll be delighted to answer some questions once we go through the presentation. Um, as Justine mentioned, I'm going to start by giving you an overview of our very ambitious Star of the South project in Australia. I'll talk about the current status and really touch on why. Why is this opportunity here? And I've noticed that's a theme throughout some of the presentations and I think it's, it's a really great thing to focus on. Uh, and finally, I will touch on some of the job and the economic opportunities and the work we're doing in terms of developing local industry. Okay, starting with a project overview, for those who are not familiar with our project, we are Australia's first proposed offshore wind project. We are really delighted that there are a few others popping their heads up and uh, looking at other parts of Australia's coastline, but uh, we have been proud to be developing this project and pioneering the industry over the past few years. And continuing uh, the Gippsland region's role in powering the state of Victoria. So, so for those of you familiar with uh, Australian geography, this is a map that's zoomed in on Victoria. You can see Wilson's Promontory there, the southernmost tip of the mainland. And that is the area, and um, as you can see in the, uh, the boundaries there, just off the coast of Gippsland, a rather large site, nearly 500 square kilometres. Uh, as well as some transmission routes that we're currently investigating. So a couple of hours to the east of Melbourne, for those of you who've visited our shores before. 
We are starting with a, ra a rather large project. We are ambitious. So up to 2.2 gigawatts of installed capacity, around seven to 25 kilometres off the coast. We're not yet at the stage of selecting a preferred turbine, but we do know that we're targeting for hundreds of wind turbines. Uh, I think in the introduction, it was powering around 1.8 million homes, 1.2, it's somewhere within this range. Um, but we do know around 20% of the state of Victoria's electricity needs. We are currently in the feasibility phase for our project. So our focus is very much on all the important and necessary investigations that we need to do uh, both technically and environmentally to get the project up and going. And that will continue to be a focus over some years. And we're really pleased to be working under an exploration license, which was granted to us from the Australian government back in March, 2019. And you'll notice the theme in this presentation, it's much um, like the message that Bruce shared in the first presentation, this partnership between government, between policymakers, as well as industry uh, and private investment such as ourselves that can help get offshore wind projects such as Star of the South off and going. A little uh, photo of our team here, and I used to say that this photo um, was our anxiety inducing photo in COVID times. Look how close we are. This uh, photo was actually taken in March, just before the world changed and we all got locked down and needed to keep a much greater distance from each other. Um, but this was taken down in the main street of Yarram in the coastal town of, um, down in Gippsland and represents uh, what we call our international experience and the local know-how. So the project itself was initiated by Australian developers back in 2012 as a high level concept. And 2017 was a really big year for us because it is the year that um, really got this project off and going with some investment and backing from Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners one of the global leaders in offshore wind and certainly a lot of experience. And um, look, I won't go through the points there because we've got Thomas here and he can speak much um, broader to CIP's qualifications. But the key point around this is we really do see the benefit in having that international experience. And I'm very lucky to have a number of colleagues uh, from the UK, from Denmark, from Belgium also here in Australia to join our Victorian team. Uh, to really combine with the local knowledge and the settings, the, the environmentalists and so forth that need to contribute to this development and feasibility phase. And of course, understanding the local electricity market. And it's been one of the key um, success factors in taking it forward is that combination of knowledge. So this is where we get to the why. And I'm, I'm sure I don't need to uh, make a strong case to this crowd because I'm sure there's um, a lot of offshore wind enthusiasts that I'm speaking to. But I think it is often important to sometimes go back to the basics. And we found that very important with a new industry. So uh, in Australia, one of the things we often hear is, um, well, surely that's a European technology. You know, Australia is very big. We've got a lot of land. We don't need to go offshore. And uh, you know, what, why would we need that here? So, you know, I think really importantly, there's a reason why offshore wind is one of the world's fastest growing technologies. And one thing that we can't ignore is the scale, the vast scale that we can achieve with building offshore wind projects, building out at sea with the larger turbines, as well as um, not conflicting with land uses. So yes, while Australia is a big country, a lot of it is desert away from load centres. And when you look at the challenge of the amount of renewable energy capacity that we will need to transition not only our energy system, but other industries, uh, we'll very much start to run into issues with conflicting land uses and so forth as we get to that critical scale of renewable generation. Uh, we're very lucky in Australia to have very strong, consistent and reliable winds in Bass Strait. Uh, for those of you who've been out there in a boat, perhaps it's not quite as windy as the uh, the southernmost tip of New Zealand, as we saw on one of the earlier maps, but I can certainly vouch for the windiness uh, out between uh, Victoria and Tasmania. And really what we're facing here in Australia is quite a significant transition. So offshore wind represents the potential to improve our system security. Um, currently around 75 to 80% of our electricity here in Australia is generated from, from coal-fired generation. 
Uh, we have around 20 gigawatts of base load power, which is expected to be retired over the next 20 years. As for where it happens in that 20 year lifestyle, uh, life cycle, it's still very much up in the air. So we're gonna need significant amount of capacity to replace that. And the great thing about where we're located as Star of the South is that we're in an area which is traditionally a coal mining town, uh, Gippsland and the Latrobe Valley, where there's a lot of grid capacity. So we're able to plug in, make use of the assets and the infrastructure that exists in that region. And importantly, be able to transition uh, workers who are skilled, whether that be from the oil and gas sector, coal mining, electricity generation, even fishing. Uh, there's a lot of workers that in the future will be looking for new industries and offshore wind is certainly generating a lot of excitement within those communities. Uh, and one thing that I'll go into briefly, because I think this is quite an interesting scientific way to look at it, is this diversified resource. So meeting that challenge of moving away from a traditional power um, generation source, that baseload power we've seen, to one that is more variable, is going to require a different way of looking at it. And so what we found, and this was a really interesting discovery this year, and something that perhaps is relevant to New Zealand and other jurisdictions, but I think it's a really neat example of, of rather than looking at things just you know, in spreadsheets, LCOE and so forth, what is the total system value that technologies like offshore wind can provide? And uh, what you can see here on this slide is a map of the state of Victoria. Uh, we plotted here the existing generation sources as well as what's in the pipeline. Uh, certainly over 30 megawatts. So these are some of the sizable projects we've got. And what we found is that a lot of the renewable energy uh, you know, generation, the new projects, they're all occurring over to the west of the state. And we found that there was a strong value in the ge geographical diversification. So tapping into a different kind of weather pattern so that you're not reliant on that same wind resource or that same solar resource. And I think many of us are familiar with the duck curve with solar. So as the solar starts to drop off, um, what we found is that's the time of day where the offshore wind is blowing at its strongest in Bass Strait. So not only do we have a time of day benefit in terms of generating power, we also found a link. So looking into some weather data, and this is where it got really scientific, but going back 30 years, a really strong meteorological link between the offshore winds in Bass Strait and the hottest days and seasons. So days that are over 35 degrees, where our electricity system is most under pressure, is the time that the offshore wind is the strongest. So it can play a really important security role as we get hotter summers. And uh, certainly Victorians have been vulnerable to the same risks as uh, Californians on the other side of the world, where we have seen shortages. Um, some years ago, our market operator did need to switch off the power. Some 200,000 homes were uh, affected by those rolling brownouts. And we're really uh, living sort of summer to summer at this stage. And as more base load power comes out, more of that coal generation comes out, this is only going to become a bigger issue uh, for the citizens. So that's why we think that offshore wind um, can help not only manage energy security, but also suppress wholesale power prices uh, as we go along. A little overview on offshore wind in Australia, and these are just a few of the headlines that we've pulled out from this year. So looking at where Australia sits on the world stage of offshore wind development, I would say we are in the policy development phase. So earlier this year, uh, the Australian Government uh, Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, DISA for short, we all love a good acronym here, um, started work on the Offshore Clean Energy Bill. And it's been a really important um, thing for our industry because some of you may already know this, but um, for those that don't, our offshore wind uh, resource, our site is located in Commonwealth waters, so under Australian government jurisdiction. Um, however, uh, the state of Victoria also has a key role being the state where the transmission infrastructure would come in. So um, it is important not just to deal with one level of government, but indeed both. And earlier this year, the Australian government did commit $4.8 million in its budget to finalise this regulatory framework, which will not only assist projects like ours uh, as in offshore wind, but other offshore clean energy technologies. 
I won't touch too much on that work because I know you're fortunate to have Belinda Wilson from the department, from the Australian Government, who will give you a good overview uh, on Wednesday on this topic. We also saw recently the Victorian Government announce $108 million to support innovative clean energy projects. So uh, not only is the Government uh, looking for a renewable future, so we have a renewable energy target of 50% by 2030 in this state, uh, but we also are looking at the, the technologies that we'll need sort of post 2025 when a lot of these projects have, have come on. What are these new technologies? What sort of kickstart might they need? So whether that's hydrogen, offshore wind, uh, other low emissions technologies, the government's really starting to um, get on board and, and go forward with some of this work, which is fantastic to see. An overview of some of our current activities. As I mentioned, right now, the focus is really on capturing that local environment. And it's critically important, while there's a lot of offshore wind experience uh, from the Northern Hemisphere and emerging out of Asia, as we know, the conditions uh, in each country are very unique. And what we're finding in Australia is there's a uniqueness to our marine environment uh, and our, our jurisdiction here compared to the rest of the world. So we're doing quite a lot of work. We have uh, surveys going on, marine mammals, so the whales, sharks, dolphins, seals, uh, we've got planes going up essentially every month doing the uh, aerial bird surveys and counts. We're doing some fish surveys and um, I might just give a plug to our LinkedIn and our Facebook pages because we are sharing quite a lot of content out of those which is really interesting and does generate um, some interesting conversation, particularly some tussles going on between octopuses and sharks and those sorts of things, um, but really giving us that good picture of what's down there. We've got our wind and wave monitoring, which has been ongoing for more than 12 months now, as well as geophysical studies. So um, there's a picture there from a local vessel out of Lakes Entrance in the east of Victoria, which was deployed earlier this year to start to understand the composition of the seabed and uh, importantly inform our early design work and uh, assumptions around particularly what sort of um, foundation might we be able to use in this unique environment. We've also got um, onshore soil testing going on for our transmission route, flora and fauna surveys. Um, and certainly we've been very uh, pleased by our results so far. All of this information is going into what we call our baseline studies, which uh, in turn will feed into the environmental assessment and approvals processes, which we're currently engaged in with various levels of government. Um, just a shout out to our survey program collaborators collaborators and I think again this is another success story in terms of a new technology. Um, we found that there's quite a lot of data gaps when you start to go out into that marine environment. It's not necessarily been mapped before. So we're really pleased to be working with our lead consultants on our marine ecology um, survey program RPS. Uh, and I do I noticed Tamara was on the call earlier so shout out to Tamara if you're still with us. But um, all of these partners, so academic institutions, research institutions, um, this has been a really good way to get the industry off and going and to get people excited about offshore wind as a technology um, and benefiting those other areas. So scientific research, uh, marine aquaculture, helping um, boost those other capabilities. And another really important part of the project, and um, I'm sure it's something New Zealand's also conscious of, is um, when you're introducing new technology, it's so important to bring the community and the landholders along with you. So what we're seeing in Australia is a lot of people sort of proposing projects, um, some of them coming out of the woodwork a little bit, and we start to see opposition forming to these because it's different. It's a change from what's existed. And some of these projects can have impact. So we've taken an approach from day one to really be very open and transparent about the work that we are doing, particularly in those Gippsland communities. We've run some major consultation periods where we have found that key areas of interest, um, number one, local jobs and industry opportunities. And what I would say is that we're really lucky to enjoy community support. Um, we've got a statistic there around some research we undertook, some random telephone and online surveys, which showed 86% support, positive or neutral towards the project, um, which is quite different, I might say, to some of the on-land projects that are being proposed in the same region. And many people see that it's this um, local jobs, the industry opportunities, as well as the infrastructure 
not necessarily being in anyone's backyard um, as, a, as a reason to support it and get behind it and advocate for it. Um, there was also interest in managing impact, fishing in the area, another important part of any offshore wind development, um, as well as our site investigations, sharing the findings and so forth. A few of the things we've done is set up a local office in Yarram, as um, you can see in the picture here, this is a mural we had painted actually by a Mongolian artist to, to match the rest of the township, which um, has these murals. So again, becoming part of the, that Gippsland community, as well as setting up a local advisory group that um, provides input to the project, as well as a channel for us to share information and spread it out to the rest of the community. Okay, and um, I'll just touch a little bit on the local jobs, investment and opportunities. As I mentioned earlier, this is one of the key reasons that people really support projects like this, because many of our regions are facing an uncertain economic future. Um, this is a photo of a guy, um, his name is Tony, he's great, he's actually on our community advisory group. He is a current coal worker, so he currently works in the coal-fired power stations in Gippsland and La Trobe Valley, and he is one of the biggest supporters of uh, Star of the South and Offshore Wind. He joins most forums that we speak at, he is so enthusiastic. And um, it's people like Tony who've got these stories in terms of their future and how they've helped power our state, but they're now looking for that opportunity for their kids and their grandkids to continue that tradition. Um, as I say, not just, um, you know, in, in the same forms of power generation, but they're really looking to the future. And there's a strong understanding, I would say, amongst many that um, the current facilities that they work at are, are reaching end of life um, and that we need to start looking at the technologies of the future, offshore wind being a big one of them. So given we get so many questions around um, jobs and, and local content and what does the local supply chain look like, we did do some economic modelling with a firm called Alpha Beta Australia, um, part of the Accenture Group, which found that essentially at the start of the South, if built to its full capacity of 2.2 gigawatts, could provide around 3,000 direct jobs in Australia over its lifetime, which is pretty incredible. Um, the types of jobs that we go and speak to people about are the marine crew, turbine technicians, support staff, um, and those opportunities to reskill and retrain. As I mentioned, I think one of the um, really interesting things is it's not necessarily the construction boom that people are interested in. And there's a good acknowledgement that a lot of the skills and the highly specialised construction work might need to come from overseas where you have those uh, highly specialised vessels and so forth. But it's really those long term opportunities. It's a job, whether it's for 25, 30 years, uh, maintaining the wind farm. And that's very localised, so you don't need to, um, in fact, it would be quite crazy to bring people in from all over the world to, to service these things. Once the local people are trained up, um, it represents a great industry for them. What we also found is it's not just about the direct jobs, the people that our tier one suppliers or our um, OEMs would employ. It's the indirect and induced jobs. So whether that's in manufacturing, particularly through the construction phase, whether there's opportunities in the downstream supply chain that we've identified, um, but also induced jobs. So um, for example, people might not often think about it, but the tourism industry, some of our biggest supporters are the tourist operators who can see opportunities to run charter boats, uh, offshore wind farm safaris. I think our CEO once told me a story that in Denmark, they released something like 4,500 tickets for people to do a, an offshore wind safari, a tour of the wind farm. Um, I think within a week they had over 75,000 people apply, everyone wanted to go out on a boat. Um, I've heard stories of, for example, um, in the UK where there's a visitor centre that attracts 35,000 visitors every year to that regional town to go and um, learn more about this offshore wind farm because it's such an engineering marvel. And for the local motel owners, the pub owners, um, in Yarram, the town where we, we, we were um, looking to and we've got our office, um, you know, those shops are closing because the populations aren't there to sustain it. So the, the enticement of having people come into their area, not just because there's long-term job opportunities that help the whole economy, but um, some of these side opportunities is what really gets people excited. So that is basically a little overview of some of these, um, what we call the indirect and the induced jobs, which rises to around 12,800, 12, including um, nearly 1,200 long-term jobs 
putting all of those benefits into perspective. Um, looking at the investment again is a very large project. So should this be a um, you know 2.2 gigawatt project, it's uh, 8.7 billion dollars of direct investment, uh, including most of that in that local region, which is um, critically important for their future going forward. Um, just finally, because I do know, I think there's some nice synergies with um, our, our friends from across the Tasman Sea, as we say in New Zealand, because um, as we know, our industries often collaborate um, suppliers that work across Australia and New Zealand. Um, so we often get asked around how companies can get interested in our project and um, talk about supplying to our project, even in these early days. So we've got something called the Industry Capability Network. Uh, there is a gateway which is live and accepts general EOIs. So I think at this stage we have around 300 businesses registered. Uh, you don't need to be in Australia, so anyone interested on the call can submit their interest if you just go to that industry capability network and search for Star of the South. Uh, we also have an Australian industry participation plan which we have published online as required by Australian regulation. And we really look for any opportunity, and this is why I'm really delighted to be here today, because it um, gives us another platform to get our message out and share with um, people what we're doing. But all of these industry bodies, there's quite a lot in our region, and I won't go through all of the, the uh, outfits listed there, but there are many, many people who are interested in collaborating and making sure that offshore wind can, first of all, um, as we say, benefit the region, the Gippsland region, the rest of Australia, um, sorry, the rest of Victoria, then we've got Australia and um, New Zealand there, slash, and uh, international. So we actually have New Zealand called out for our, um, our tier three there, but certainly interested in any kind of collaborations. And you could say, you know, what does that opportunity look like? We really see our role as um, facilitating collaboration between local industry as well as that global supply chain. So we have some good examples, for example, our um, floating LIDAR, our wind and wave measuring devices, a French technology deployed by a French company. They came out, they sent their technicians, they spent some weeks here uh, about 12 months ago and trained up a local company called Tech Ocean. So basically um, bringing the international technology partnering them with a local supplier who can maintain it and have that um, knowledge going forward to essentially get that good collaboration and the industry development happening in a really tangible way. So um, as Star of the South as a developer, we really see that as our role is making those introductions, encouraging collaboration wherever possible. Uh, as, well as, sharing, as well as sharing information and working with those economic development leaders, as well as international uh, agencies who might have an interest in this matter. Okay, I think I've gone probably to my 20 minutes, so I'll finish it there, but would be very delighted to um, answer any questions in the Q&A, unless Thomas actually wants to say a few words. Thanks very much, Erin. Um, we've got a really great flow of speakers, I think. Yeah, the, each, each piece is just really adding to the picture that, that I, th I hope is building for people who may may or may not be um, familiar with, with offshore wind and what that potential potentially looks like for New Zealand. So yeah, thanks very much, Erin. Great to hear all about Star of the South. Um, and as Erin has mentioned, um, our next and final um, panelist this evening is Thomas. Um, so Thomas is joining us from Tokyo. Um, he is a partner at Copenhagen, Copenhagen Investment and Infrastructure Partners. Um, and as Erin mentioned, they are investors. And so Thomas is going to talk to us about the investment perspective um, into offshore wind. So one of the things that we're very conscious of, for example, is that there are significant amount, amounts of green investment dollars um, in the world looking for good green investments to make. Um, and so um, I think Thomas offers us a really practical insight uh, from an investor's perspective um, into this area. So Thomas. Thank you very much, uh, Justine, and thank you for having me on as a speaker. Um, I know we're already into the second hour, so I'll try to keep it relatively brief to, uh, to make sure that no one falls, falls asleep now in the last session here. Um, just very briefly on, on CIP, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, as you said, Justine, about um, how do we as a developer and investor look at um, offshore wind uh, and what do we think is required for being able to um, realize this great potential um, for offshore wind in general, but also in particular in, in APEC region. So 
but but just first on on CIP. CIP is a is a fund is a fund manager, and we are investing into um, clean energy infrastructure assets on behalf of institutional investors, Infra uh, pension funds, uh, life insurance companies, and so on. And we do that through um, long-term funds. So our funds are twenty-year funds. So it's basically been doing with a with a with a buy and hold uh, perspective. Um, we are today managing more than 10 billion euros and we are in the process of fundraising for a, what we call fund four, which uh, looks to be the, the largest uh, renewable energy fund uh, raised so far. And this is capital that we are investing in, in early stage project development phase through construction and, and are holding after completion. We are doing that on a global scale. Um, and if you look on the next page here, this is, this is our, today our offshore wind portfolio of where we are developing offshore wind. So for us who have been part of the offshore wind sector from the very start, um, 12, 15 years ago, where this was very much a uh, Northwestern European um, technology, um, it's been, amazing and great to see how this has now sort of evolved and transitioned into a truly global uh, industry. Uh, we, we have today two projects, or we have a couple of projects in Europe, but the one in Germany and, and the UK is projects in operation. We are developing uh, floating wind in Italy, but we are also developing, as you can see, projects in the US, um, portfolio of five, five gigawatts or so, where 1.6 gigawatts has secured offtake already. Um, and then in, in Asia, which is really, I think, the, the next very, very big market with a great potential, we are having development activities in, in, in Korea, in Japan, in Taiwan. Um, and the interesting thing is, as many of you, um, I assume, know, is that you have recently had Japan, South Korea, China, all sort of announcing their zero carbon sort of ambition for 2050 and 2060. So. And being able to realize that obviously you need sort of huge clean energy power plants and offshore wind is really a great sort of technology for, for that. Lastly, we have Star of the South and um, Australia's uh, first offshore wind projects with Aaron just talked about. We have been active in that for the last three years and are uh, really excited about the prospect for this, uh, for this great project. And um, hopefully we can also bring it to, to New Zealand and obviously sessions like these and which Taranaki has a sort of schedule for the next couple of days, I think is exactly what you need. And we are truly excited about the, the, the future for, for these projects. Um, if we go to the next one here, I don't, think, I don't think I want to say a lot about it. We've already heard a couple of times about the prospect and potential of gigawatts of capacities in the APEC region. Um, I think what's important and what I will talk a bit about today is what is it you need to be able to uh, realize plus 200 gigawatts of offshore wind in, in Asia Pacific, where today, excluding China, you probably have um, one gigawatt constructed uh, and then a few, few demo projects across a number of different jurisdictions. If you want to realize this, these gigawatts over the next 30 years, the, obviously the amount of capital required is enormous, both in terms of equity and development equity risk takers, but also from debt financing and, and banks uh, and institutions participating in realizing this. So how is it we do this? And, and what is it that is required for, for, um, for these markets to really attract um, and bring developers, investors um, on board uh, to to take the lead on the developments. That's what I've included here on, on the next page. We, we would, as a developer, the way we are looking at this, as when we're going to a new market, there's, there's obviously a number of different things that we would be looking at, but there will be three sort of main categories where we are assessing, do we believe there's a need or a future for offshore wind in, in this market? And that could be, are the projects for the fundamentals there? Is there a regulatory framework or is there a way where we believe that this can be implemented? 
And then lastly, uh, what are the, the financial sort of feasibility of an offshore wind project in the energy mix of that jurisdiction? So the project fundamentals is something you could say from a desktop analysis is, is relatively simple to do, but of course uh, you don't, there, there's always a trade-off in terms of how much you're doing and how much certainty do you have before you, you enter the projects. But uh, it's everything from wind speed to water depths, um, whether it's then depending on fixed bottom of floating and uh, the seabed conditions in general, what is the distance to shore, um, what other critical infrastructure uh, is around and available to construct the project. Um, do we need to design, think about hurricanes, earthquakes, typhoons, um, all of these things can be dealt with. It's a matter of designing the project uh, properly. And, and then of course, uh, very, very important uh, matters as well is, is there actually grid available? So you can, you can take all of these boxes, but if you don't have any grid available, it's not gonna be a project. Um, so, so grid, either it needs to be available or there needs to be a plan for building it out. Um, and of course, it's, it's, it's a different game when you're going from comparing or considering an onsh onshore wind park of 100 megawatt and you're now going to go big utility scale offshore with 500 megawatts or one gigawatt or two gigawatts like we start the south. It's, it's um, grid is always important. But uh, at these, at these uh, magnitudes of whether your entire assessment of the project is dependent on uh, the size of the project, um, 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 grid is something you need clarity on relatively early. Um, and then of course, there are all the other matters uh, which you will have in any country, sort of the, what we will call site constraints, everything from shipping lanes to fishery areas, uh, agreements with fishermen. So, this is this is this is maybe site constraints is this matters where you would never get certainty early on, but but of course you need to have some sort of understanding of how difficult would this be in the end of uh, reaching agreements. Um, um, so all of these matters here is something where you can do something desktop analysis, and then you would in the end in throughout the development phase um, go much deeper on each of them. And I think this is exactly why, at least one of the reasons why this is very different from onshore wind, because the amount of capital you need to get certainty on these project fundamentals doesn't really compare to, to onshore wind. I think that was one of the other panelists who were saying it's probably 20 times more expensive or so. I think it's actually even more you're deploying in terms of capital in the development phase here could easily be for a, uh, between 500 megawatt project and one gigawatt project be 150 million US dollars in development money before you, you reach the construction phase. And of course, this is a spent profile where you really want to shape it uh, and de-risk the project. So the capital you have at risk in that phase is, um, is balanced towards the certainty of getting clarity on each of those items um, and this is not even talking about offtake yet. So this is just understanding the project. So a, a very important uh, a matter uh, where you, in the beginning, uh, can do quite a lot yourself, and you can get you can get yourself comfortable that this is actually something which you can bring through in that market or on that specific side. Uh, the next box that I've included here is what what I would call regulatory framework. So this is all. This is, this is one of those things that, um, and if you go to a new market, you often wouldn't really have clarity on this. And that's the, that's the flip side of, of, um, of this. You, you, you somehow you need to understand what is the way through um, obtaining all the permits. What is, what is the, the things that the steps the project needs to take to get an offtake or PPA? Um, and, and again, how, how do I secure that grid connection? Um, and if you go to a market where there's less visibility on that, at least you need to have some sort of understanding from engagement with stakeholders, uh, governments, and, and so on, on are there a willingness to put this, uh, these, um, these steps in place or uh, working with 
us, the developers, to make sure that there is a way through uh, to obtain these things. Because if, if you can't, there will not be a project. And this is exactly what we have been spending uh, a lot of time on in Australia together with Erin and her team and, and working with the local government, the Victorian government and the federal government in terms of how do we get, how do we get the permit process rolling and what is it you need to do to be able to obtain these things. So what got us comfortable three years ago was that yes, there is no pathway through today, but we are we are comfortable enough that we can work with the governments in terms of getting that regime in place. And that can be sufficient. Yeah, that, can, that can make, I think, developers comfortable that even though it's not there, maybe it's, there's a good chance it will be and they would be willing to take those risks. Um, this, is one of the, this is one of the places or one of the areas where I think Taiwan has been in particular successful. So Taiwan today is really the, the first moving market in Asia with with multiple gigawatts, either in, in um, late stage construction or late stage development. And what they did really, really well, I think, was that they made it very clear they had a high ambition for offshore wind. And they were basically saying, this is the regulatory path that you need to go through to obtain all your permits. So it was, as a developer, you were coming to the market and it was obviously a new market. And it was also been clear, looking retrospectively, that they were learning as they were going which I think is not a surprise, but I think the good thing was that the were frame, you knew what you had to do. And that made us and others comfortable enough to start um, spending development capital, developing projects, because they've been very, um, very clear in terms of articulating their ambition for the industry in, in Taiwan. And I think that's also what you now see in Japan. You see it in Korea, less so in Japan, but you are seeing it though. But in Korea, at least, you're seeing it relatively clearly. And they're being very firm on the 112 gigawatts by 2030. You're seeing the same, same thing in Vietnam and Japan. Uh, you're seeing it in, in Australia as well to some degree, maybe not so much specifically on offshore, but you're seeing it, each of the states having very clear renewable uh, targets and ambitions. And this is exactly what you need. So you need to have these ambitions. You need to have leaders who, who want to uh, take the responsibility of bringing um, uh, carbon emissions to zero and uh, leading the way. And of course, developers need to, to work with them. Um, so a very, and a very important element as well. The last thing I've included here is then um, the financial feasibility. So obviously one thing is the project needs to be right. You need to have all the fundamentals. You need to have the wind speed. You need to be able to construct it and so on, the infrastructure. You need to obtain all the permits um, and find a way through that, get the grid connection and so on. But you also need to be able to finance it. Um, and as these projects are getting bigger and bigger, um, the, the demand for not only equity, but also for debt financing is getting larger and larger. Uh, so the focus on bankability on everything in the entire project is increasing. So obviously the most important thing will be the offtake agreement in itself. Uh, banks are much more conservative, obviously, in terms of financing projects, which is fully emergent. And so they want to see a some sort of uh, offtake agreement where the merchant risk is lifted off to to someone who is better taking that risk um, and those terms are really really important in terms of being able to attract financing this is one of the this is one of the you could say if i need to compare that a bit this is one of the very good learnings they have had in taiwan where the offtaker is a state-owned company um, but i think they they didn't really in the beginning at least have the full picture in terms of what does that mean? How would international financing look at that um, very domestically written PPA? Um, but I think the banks evolved, they understood it much better now and uh, understand how it plays together with the civil code and so on. So it's, I think it's an evolution on all sides. You have the same challenges, challenges in other markets. Uh, but, but it, it is and it will continue to be a an, an tremendously important sort of element in being able to secure the financing you need to build these uh, power plants. Um, 
currency risks is another is another thing you know obviously for new zealand that's much less of a problem but if you're talking about um vietnam for example and you want they want to build 50 gigawatts of offshore wind i think is what they're saying um so it, i yeah, i think it, it needs to be a us dollar <laughs> Uh, offtake agreement. Otherwise, I don't think you can you can get anyone to take that risk, and you can attract the amount of capital to those markets. So there, there are many things on the financial side as well, which will be a very very important uh, feature to be able to attract the uh, the capital required to to build these 200 gigawatts of offshore wind. Um, and this is where this is where export credit agencies really can play a huge role because they can go in, they can assume those risks. But the flip side of that is that export credit agencies, they participate if each of their home countries are exporting equipment. And that's, of course, a bit of a contradiction because each of these new markets who really want to see offshore wind grow in their region, they also want local content or what they, what they mean with that is they want manufacturing to happen domestically. And if that happened domestically, ECA is an export credit agency can only play a smaller role so that's really a sort of it's a bit of a complex uh, uh situation uh, where also uh, each of the the governments from those export credit agencies somehow needs to to work together and looking at how can they support the industry or is this only about supporting export of uh, part equipment or is it also supporting capital is it supporting uh, uh what what is it really we're supporting here and it, it it's not a it's it's a complex uh, conversations and it has contradictions. But I think if this needs to happen uh, to the scale we want it, we we, we hope to see it. Um, we need a solutions uh, where the markets who are attracting the industry really can see the benefits of creating jobs, getting um, 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 uh, products being uh, manufactured domestically. But at the same time, uh, if we are talking many multiple gigawatts of offshore wind, we also need to make sure that we can actually finance it. Um, so this is this is just a snapshot of I think some of the key considerations we as an investor and developer we are having when we are assessing new markets, and every market is different. Um, and, and I think one of the very, very attractive things now is that in the beginning, offshore wind were, or the technology were homogeneously, you know, you, you knew the problems uh, because it happened in Denmark, Norway, and the UK, and it were very similar, but now it's very different because now what we see as a, as a developer is that the, 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 the challenges we have, it's not so much offshore wind, it's more the domestic angle of it in where the project is. So it's, it's much more driven by the location of where you're developing the project than actually developing offshore wind uh, now. And I think this is, this is new. This, that's not how it was five years ago. This is really, I think this is the effect of seeing how everything has gone global. And you are now realizing that, um, and I'm saying that knowing that offshore wind obviously is not a mature technology yet, but it's just moved so fast. Uh, and, and, and what we are dealing with when we are dealing with our and challenging across all of our project pipeline, it is really the problems or challenges which comes from um, where they are located and less, to a lesser degree of it being uh, offshore wind. So um, on that note, I think that, that, took, me, that took me to the end. Um, thank you again, Justine, for having me on. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, very much appreciate that. Great perspective into the, the challenges, opportunities and intricacies of how some of these large projects um, actually get off the ground. And um, so that brings us to the end of our presentations from our panelists. And we, um, we, have, we had some um, questions that were coming through the, the Q&A, um, which actually have all been um, very helpfully answered by our panelists as we've gone through. So hopefully people have seen those questions and answered, um, questions answered through, through the course of the conversation. Um, there was one question that um, hasn't been answered, um, which is about, um, are we transitioning fast enough? Um, and I guess I, I'm assuming that that means a, um, a transition to um, renewables 
um, from, from our perspective, it's about focusing on emissions as opposed to whether it's renewable or not, because some renewable technology renewable technologies are not emissions free. Um, uh, in terms of our panel being able to answer that question, um, what I would say is that we actually have um, the New Zealand government um, presenting in our, um, on Wednesday. So, so I'm sure that they will cover that um, in their presentations as well. So, um, so thank you um, very much to all our panelists for, um, for your fantastic presentations tonight. And as I said, for doing so well at answering people's questions as we've gone through. Um, really thanks also to everyone who's participated um, in the webinar tonight, um, expressing that interest in offshore wind, which is nascent for New Zealand, but I think um, hopefully has that potential to really help us as a country move forward into um, an exciting low emissions um, and energy export future. Um, so yeah, I just want to say again, um, particularly thank you to our Northern Hemisphere colleagues who have got, got up very early in the morning um, and have done remarkably well. Um, so they must have had some good coffee to help them. Um, so thank you very, very much um, to, to Bruce and Bruno who have got up. Um, I actually have no idea what time it is in Japan, Thomas, um, but hopefully it wasn't, wasn't too strange a time for you. Um, and also just a reminder um, that if you are registering for the online only version of our forum on Wednesday, um, use the uh, link to the registration that's sent um, with the Zoom link um, and register in advance for that. And if you have, if anyone has any questions, um, please just contact um, Stephanie Laird, that's stephanie at venture.org.nz. And then I'd also obviously um, look forward to seeing those of you who are coming, attending in person on Wednesday, um, seeing you here in New Plymouth with hopefully a nice sunny day for you all. Maybe a little bit of wind just to, just to help make the case. Um, so that, that's it um, for this evening's webinar. Thanks very much again to everyone for participating. Thank you very much to our panellists. Very um, thought-provoking, um, insightful presentations tonight and hopefully I think that that has really helped answer perhaps um, some questions that people had, may have raised some more as well, um, and we can talk about all of that more on Wednesday. So thanks very much, everybody. Um, and as we say in New Zealand, uh, ka kite. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. Thank you very much again. It's just been fun. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, bye now. Bye. Bye, everyone.